Hello friends and fellow lovers of all things beachy. Welcome to The Beach Speaks. I'm your host and beach lover page friend, sharing conversations and stories to help you reconnect with the beach, return to your soul, and reimagine your life. Whether they're an entrepreneur, a conscious creator, or just someone who loves the beach, all my guests have a story to tell about what makes the beach the place to be. So grab a cool drink, sit back in your beach chair, stick your toes in the sand, and enjoy this episode of The Beach Speaks. I was on an exercise power walk on the beach, which is really kind of a misnomer because I stop so much to take pictures and videos. I'm not sure how much exercise I'm getting. I should probably call it an inspirational beach walk. But anyway, I was brainstorming themes for the podcast when I began thinking about all the marine life in the ocean, which then got me thinking about scuba diving. And then, of course, our friends, John Bailey and his wife, Jennifer Young, came to mind because, well, they are super into scuba diving, and I knew they'd have some cool stories to tell. I decided to call the episode Close Encounters of the Marine Kind, and it would probably need to be in two parts, one where they tell their stories, and then a second part where I can share mine. And just to briefly introduce you to John and Jennifer, they live outside of Tampa and part of a group of our close friends that I like to call our Tampa St. Pete crew. John, an environmentalist, studied at the University of Florida and is an exceptional underwater marine photographer. Jennifer is a network engineer who is exceptional at shooting lionfish and swimming with, and dare I say, swimming from, sharks. So to hear more about all that, let's dive in for part one of Close Encounters of a Marine Kind. Welcome, John and Jennifer. Hey, John and Jennifer, welcome to The Beach Speaks. I know you've got some great stories to tell and share with us. So I want to start off with the question I ask all my guests is, how is the beach speaking to you. And uh, Jennifer, or John, you can decide who, where to start. <laughs> We're going to let Jennifer take that one. Um, it's more about being close to nature. Obviously, the beach is the entry point into the water. We both love nature. We love the marine life. It's like a whole other world. Um, get, when you go into the water and you're scuba diving, you're in the water, you're around life that you never see when you're on the surface. It's it's pretty amazing and it's pretty, it's soothing. It's actually one of those things where when you're underwater and you're diving, the only focus you have is obviously you're underwater, so you have to pay attention to the life around you. But um, it's basically going into an environment that you never encounter anywhere else. It's a whole other world, other life, ecosystem, um, pretty beautiful. And, and you're weightless, right? So you're weightless and, uh, you know, the you can't hear, you know, the hearing is, they actually, you do hear things. You hear your bubbles. If you're on a coral reef, you'll hear the, you'll, you'll hear the, the coral reef fish grazing, chip, 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 chip on all the, uh, you know, on all the coral and everything. And so, you know, it's just a completely surreal experience. Yeah, I can really relate to that because in the few times I've been diving, <laughs> I I told a friend, I said, you kind of sound like Darth Vader with <laughs> the sound. At least I remember, it just oh, kind of breathing. reminded me, the yeah, breathing, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just kind of imagine that sound and that, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. even that, I mean, a good diver regulates their breath. So it's even and, you know unless you see something that's going <laughs> to raise your blood pressure and then you breathe faster. Or you see something that's really cool, like, oh my gosh, yeah, look, it's a manta ray, you know? Yeah. Then you start breathing a little quicker. Yeah. Breathing up all your air too fast. Yeah. 
And I really, really get the idea that it's a, a completely different world. Yeah. Because it, it is, you do feel like you're somewhere else. And I know a lot of people say, oh, aren't you afraid to be that far underwater? But you just lose yourself in it. Wouldn't you agree? It's just like, yeah, I think there are certain people who I think it has to do with your comfort underwater. If you're comfort underwater, then you're not going to dwell on it. Uh, but some people are not comfortable under the water because it is so alien to them. And then they they worry about it too much. But the reality is that the gear rarely fails and you've got a backup regulator and you've got a another hopefully another diver who's close enough to share their air with you if they need to. Right, so, right. Yeah. So I guess I'll start with you, Jen. What got you into diving? And was it something you'd always wanted to do or something you learned later on that you thought was super cool? Well, my younger brother and his wife are avid divers. So for years, they would like they went to Fiji for their wedding anniversary and posted amazing photos and just basically hanging out with them and them telling me about the surreal um, experience of scuba diving, I was interested. I mean, it piqued my interest and um, it was on basically the books um, when I was going to do that. And then I met John and he was a hardcore diver. So it just kind of sealed the deal. It just expedited me wanting to get certified. So I basically went and looked up locally um, certification and located somebody that basically um, provided a training class, and then we, you do your base, your qualifying dives over at Devil's Den, and so over, over the course of a month, um, you know, the first couple of weeks I went to their sessions. I mean, we did like weekend things, and then finally, like the third week, I went and got you know had to do an actual qualifying dive because I want to ensure that you know how to manage your buoyancy, you know all the um, you know, details of how to clear your mask, safety, everything about safety, which is vitally important if you're going to be, you know, underwater and supported by this tank. So that's how I basically got introduced to diving. Mm. You mentioned Devil's Den. Uh, my listeners might not be familiar with that. Explain what Devil's Den is. It sounds scary. Yeah, it sounds scary, but it's basically, um, it's sort of like an area where they have um, caverns and bodies of water. You can basically go down into the caverns and there's enough to death and it's spring water. So I think it's like 72 degrees year round. You can safely go into this area where you can just do a qualifying dive. Like they'll have you test your buoyancy, uh, do a little bit of rescue diving. They explain just some basics so that in the event there are issues, uh, you can safely either guide another diver but it's a really nice area where there's like spring water and it's caverns um there's some intricate caves there that they don't introduce you to obviously because we're new divers but um how far is devil's den from here what, what, what city i don't i've never been there what city oh really yeah. um ocala, ocala? yes okay. oh, yes okay. that area oh, correct there. lots of springs in that area mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the springs here in florida are just amazing. We could probably talk about that later. But John, how did you get started in diving? I'm trying to remember. I mean, I've always been interested. I guess Jacques Cousteau in the 70s. I mean, you look, <laughs> you look at the amazing stuff under there. And I've always, as soon as, uh, I mean, I actually took diving class in Illinois in the 80s, but I never got certified because, you know, I wasn't near any water or anything like that. But then when I went to uh, grad school at the University of Florida in the 90s, uh, I was able to take a scuba class and, you know, got certified and boom, I've been on it ever since then and try to make my life as much about it as I can. I just have to stop here for a moment because hearing John talk about his early interest in scuba diving growing up in Illinois made me think about when I was growing up in Pennsylvania and learning to scuba dive never really crossed my mind until there was one blustery winter day when I was lifeguarding at the indoor pool at my high school. 
and I was kind of bored watching a handful of senior women in bathing caps with the chin straps doggy paddling around in the shallow end when a group of younger adults walked out onto the pool deck wearing wetsuits and carrying scuba tanks, ready to practice their underwater skills in the deep end. Which I thought was kind of silly, because who would want to learn to scuba here? I mean, wouldn't it be more fun to learn to dive deep in the crystal clear ocean in the Bahamas? Not the crystal clear, heavily chlorinated deep end of a swimming pool? (laughs) Well, like John, it wasn't until I moved to Florida that learning to scuba dive didn't seem silly at all. I had some friends that talked about diving all of the time. And now that I had a home computer, I could actually do all the initial training online, then go to a dive shop where we would finish the classwork and then do our open water dive in the springs near Ocala with the manatees. Now, I'm saving that story for part two of the podcast coming out in my solo episode. Now, back to John and Jennifer. It's an amazing way to get that PE credit. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I did that twice, actually. Once in undergrad and once in grad school. Yeah. Well, how did you take a a scuba class in Illinois? I mean, it was just... They just do. And then they they take a class down to the Keys for the certification dives. But... Yeah, oh. I don't remember. That's been so long, but I basically probably just didn't have the money to do that. Yeah, I've heard people learning to dive in lakes. And yeah, that too. Yeah, a lot of people do that. In tech- swimming pools. <laughs> yep, quarries, lakes and quarries, I think are big yeah. in the, across the you know, Midwest and even in Texas, I think they do that. Yeah. Okay, well, so those of you who are landlocked, there, there's still hope you can... <laughs> at least work on your certification and then what a what better uh reason to take a trip to the keys than to do a dive absolutely but you know you, you just go to your local dive shop and start asking questions and they'll be more than happy to you know answer any questions you have local dive yeah shop. people in those dive shops are they're fabulous. They are really, really into what they do. Yeah, and Definitely. They're not there for money. They're there for love of diving, for sure. No, they're not there for the money. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> Doesn't seem like no. it. Uh, well, you know, speaking of the keys, I did a dive near Marathon, I believe. Mm-hmm. And it was, um, was it Christ of the Abyss? That'd be Largo. With the statue? You yeah, have the statue. yeah. I thought that was near Marathon. Yeah, yeah, that's up in yeah. Key Largo, John Pennycamp State Park. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people do their checkout dives there. It's very shallow, no currents. It's a very safe place to do it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So I'll let uh, either one of you talk about an adventure that you've had, or where do you like to go diving the most? Mm, wow. Oh, wow. You know, it, 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 okay, so with us, it's pretty a pretty clear story whenever this comes up. So the answer to me is Fiji because they have amazing coral and super Fiji or Indonesia because the, just the diversity of animals is just amazing. And they have all these animals that just have all these strange, you know, mimicry They they look like leaves. They look like the coral, you know, and they're just, they're just amazing. It's just like, if you've ever watched the movie uh, Avatar, I mean, all that forest, that forest, they're mimicking the coral reef with that forest. And so I like that kind of thing. Whereas Jennifer... I like Pelagic. So for me, Palau. Anywhere you can see um, lots of sharks. Palau has... It's called the Blue Corner. That's what they're, one of their famous spots that people dive. You can basically anchor into the reef because the current's kind of strong because it's at a corner. And you get to see, like during certain times of year, tons of sharks. I'm definitely a sharks girl. I love sharks. So like um, 50, 60, 70 sharks swimming all, all just kind of hanging out. And you're there. right yeah. there so, with them. You're yeah, yeah. Yeah. Describe that diving with the sharks. So the, the situation with blue corner is that it's an upwelling to where you have basically like a, a wall or a cliff that's adjacent to really deep water. And the current is flowing towards that cliff and then going up and then is forced upwards. So it's called an upwelling. And these places in the ocean are where there's a high diversity of animal species because those nutrients, you know, then 
make the whole system work. You know, it's like taking these nutrients that are in the deep water and then they're, they're upwelled and then, you know, all kinds of life results from that. And so they, you know, the, so there's a concentration of life there. And in this case, this is sharks. And so you, you know, you hook into the reef be, with a hook, which is tied to a line, which is then tied to your buoyancy compensator, which is the vest you wear. And um, so you hook in so that you, you know, you don't have to waste all your air kicking and you just relax and you enjoy watching a, literally a school of 50, 70, 100 sharks all just kind of lazily swimming around. And, you know, it's you just You think right. they're used to having humans there? Well, typically, it's mating season. So they're more preoccupied with the other gender. <laughs> they don't even care about you because... They're basically swimming around looking for a mate. Yeah. You said that you liked sharks. That that was your thing. Is it just the thrill of... Honestly, it's not just sharks. Anything that's big that moves in the water. I love turtles. We, we go to Mexico. We've been to Mexico quite a few times to see whale sharks. And they're beautiful too. They're huge. And they go there to mate certain times of the year. So it's basically any animal that is moving in the water has you know it could be eels it could be sharks it could be turtles it could be um recently we went to Roatan and we were able to see it's like just squids swimming in you you know in unison multiple squids and then with it, like Indonesia it's the uh, cuttlefish so it's any animal that you can see them interact with in their particular environment it's just amazing to me to see them in their habitat see them um, mating or interacting or hunting. It's just, uh, like I said, it's like, you know, John says it's like Avatar. Yeah. And and the thing with the squids was really cool is that someone told us if you flash a light at them, they'll, you know, it, it's like close encounters of the third kind or whatever, you know, where with the lights. And so Jennifer had this go, uh, this light that flashed. So we turned it on and then they literally started coming towards us. They'd and interacting follow us with, around. It so- was, yeah, yeah. That, that was really pretty cool. So <laughs> anytime you can interact with wildlife underwater or even not is, you know, really pretty cool. Yeah. And John, I know you're an environmentalist and you are really into protecting the environment and the changes mm-hmm. and, and all of that. So have you seen changes in any of these areas? I can't have it report anything good. I mean, the, the global warming situation is not good for coral reefs. Uh, you know, it's the, the coral is not designed for hot water and um, without getting too deep into coral biology, but there, there's algae inside the coral. It's a, a symbiotic relationship with algae and polyps. And uh, they, they actually get most of their energy from the algae as opposed to like taking stuff from the water. And with the water gets too hot, they, for whatever reason, they expel the algae. And so the algae is also what gives them the color. And so it's called coral bleaching. And yeah, it's That's really um, sad. We've seen bleached coral, and then there's also uh, you know hard stony coral disease, disease that we've seen out there. So it's not good. But you know there are a lot of reefs that are still in good condition. Roatan looked was real looked really healthy. Cozumel is still hanging in there. I mean, there's still a lot of really nice coral out there. What's the most unusual experience you've had, John? in your diving? I don't know about unusual. We've had so many experiences, but one really good that comes to mind is, is like Jennifer mentioned in Palau, we were in a spot uh, where there's a, what they have, uh, they call cleaning stations for um, manta rays where, you know, the German channel. Yes. So uh, you go there and it's a cleaning station. And so the manatees come there and they'll hover while the little fish come and pick all the little parasites off of them. And so we had a really good experience there to where, you know, we went there and this really large uh, manta ray, probably 12 feet wide, somewhere in that range, really big. And it was just, and they said, make eye contact with it. And we were doing that. And it was just like, you know, kind of swimming around. And they said to form us. a bond and it yeah. appeared to happen Yeah, because this guy kept coming back for us. Like, oh, he kept circling. He taxi out, come back like a minute later, taxi out. And he just kept swirling around us for, I don't know, it was like, what, 15, 20 minutes or something. About, yeah, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. There was something else. Oh, is it the grouper? Goliath grouper. Yes. 
Jennifer, you go ahead. Well, so um, every year within Jupiter... Uh, and Jupiter isn't the planet. <laughs> Jupiter, Florida. Florida. Yeah, where Burt Reynolds <laughs> was living. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's beautiful, beautiful part of the coastline. It is. Yeah. So you're in Jupiter. So every year there's there's a certain time. Uh, I think it's uh, somewhere like between it's September August. and August. It's between the full moons of August and uh, September. Mm-hmm. So you can go down there. And these are obviously gigantic, enormous uh, groupers. They can get upwards of like 800 pounds. So they're pretty large nice. and like five, six feet in size. Um, they gather together within group order to mate. And the thing about groupers is they're called some sequential hermaphrodites. In other words, they start out in life, <clears throat> like they'll go there as females, and they do, it's called broadcast spawning. They release their eggs into the water, and then some of these females will transform into males. <laughs> what? <laughs> but it's not a, a while they're breeding. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the, the thing about Jupiter is that they form aggregations to where they all get together to do this. So you'll have uh, at times like a hundred in one place and there's very few places. There's only two or three places in the state that they know that this is even occurring. And so in the fall, they have these grouper ag- aggregations where they all come together and the, the males are just waiting for the female to get ready to release her eggs. And then she goes up in the water column and does her things. And then they could come up and release their thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's really cool. And so, you know, they, right. And then the eggs, they'll get fertilized and they'll float for miles before they wind up at their hatching grounds. Yeah. Wow. So they're not particularly concerned about you. They're concerned about the females. So you can, you know, get really close to these fish that are, you know, six, seven feet long, but you know, they're the size of a small car really. Yeah. But you know, when you're talking about breeding um, in the mating season, what have you, it would seem to me that they would be kind of protective. Well, when you first come down, they, you know, they don't, they stay away from you when you first come down because of the bubbles mostly, because the bubbles are actually make a lot of noise. But once they see you and you give them about five or 10 minutes to to relax, then they accept you. And, you know, they're not um, rocket scientists. They're preoccupied with other things. So as soon as they're cons- as soon as they're satisfied that you're not a threat, that you're not pursuing them or chasing them or whatever, then they relax and just go about okay. whatever it was they were doing, which is mostly hanging out and waiting for the females to do their thing. <laughs> right. And so another interesting thing about it is that there's these schools of cigar minnows, cigar minnows that can tell when the females are getting ready, apparently they're releasing hormones into the water or whatever. So there's these schools of cigar minnows just following the females along as well because they're, they're waiting for the females to release their eggs and they want to eat as many of them as they can. Isn't it interesting how nature just knows how this is all supposed to right? happen and they, they just know. I'm curious to know if you've gone on a dive expecting something or not expecting something. It it just did not work out the way you thought, or mm, misadventures. What about the uh, you guys got knocked and then the current? <gasps> you got lost in currents. Uh, you got to be careful about currents. Remember that time you guys had a rip, uh, like a riptide. Yeah, this I actually didn't observe this, but it is something that happens. Is by these walls. A lot of the good diving spots are called walls, where there's a, literally a, a like a cliff under the water. And, you know, sometimes the water goes down like literally thousands of feet. And, uh, you know, the currents, for whatever reason, some, because of the, you know, geology, sometimes can, instead of going up, it can go down. And our friend Stacy got caught in one of these downward currents. And it's just started to, you know, even though she was inflating her vest with the with air, the current was so strong it was it was pulling her down. Wow, that's scary. Yeah, that was pretty harrowing for her. And so, but what you have to do in that situation is swim. It's it's counterintuitive. You have to swim away from the wall, out into the open water, because the current is actually just near the wall, and then you get out of the current. But the other thing is that it doesn't. It's not constant. It will let up after a while. Uh, so you, the other alternative is to swim towards the wall and grab something, which. I guess your life depends on it, so you have to do it. But, you know, you don't want to be touching the coral or anything like that. So it's not the preferred. Yeah. So in that instance, first it took her up 
or excuse me, first it started dragging her down and then it started dragging her up just as strong. Wow. And that's dangerous because you don't want to make an ascent super fast because that can really cause some physical problems. How, how uh, deep do you normally dive? Uh, you know, we usually like to limit it to like 80 feet and we don't even like to stay down there for very long because if you think about it, the water is heavy, so it's causing a lot of pressure. So when you go down deep, it's literally squeezing the air to make it smaller. So you're breathing in like twice as much air. So if you stay down there to, you know, it, it makes you use up your air much faster. So we, we kind of like to stay in the 40, 50 foot range because you can stay down there longer. Uh, also, when you're down deep, it absorbs a lot of the light. So that the things are more colorful, actually, higher in yeah, the water Yeah, that's what column. I was thinking, too. Yeah. How about you, Jennifer? Do you have an experience that you'd probably not want to repeat again? <laughs> well, I don't know. See, it's there's a good and bad experience. There was a time, um, anyway, we were shooting lionfish. Meaning, like, shooting them. <laughs> lionfish have been inter- is a Pacific fish. It doesn't, it didn't, it's not native to the Caribbean, to this part of the world. They're an invasive species. So people have released them from their fish tank. Lionfish, gorgeous fish. Always love seeing them, even though even though they don't belong in the Caribbean. There's no natural predators to lionfish. They have those spines, and so things don't eat them. And they breed at tremendous rates. And decimate. Existing. Right, and so they and then they they just eat all the little fish. So they've really become a, a highly invasive species throughout the Caribbean. So for that reason, people cull them with spears, and that's what she's talking about: shooting them with a spear. Right, and so we were shooting. This is one of the we've been to the Caymans. We actually got engaged in the Caymans in one one of the trips, but one of the initial ones, I believe, we went to Cayman Brac. And we were shooting lionfish, and it was one of the first times that I've ever actually been shooting lionfish. And there were some groupers around that were trying to feed, and like minutes into spearing it, the you know the blood of the lionfish went into the water. We got surrounded by three oh, yeah. circling sharks. Yeah, which yeah. for me was exciting and scary at the same time because. It was one of the first times I've I've actually hunted something that attracted a predator. And there were three sharks and they were circling constantly. We actually want to, uh, this occurred like near the end of the dive. So we actually surfaced, but luckily, but it was um, scary because it was my first time ever experiencing something like that. It was pretty amazing too, because she, within like, Three minutes yes. of shooting that, the, the smell got in the water. And those those sharks were like, we, did, Circling we didn't us. see that any sharks anywhere. And within three minutes of shooting that lionfish, <laughs> there were two sharks. And as we were ascending, we saw more third, sharks. Yeah. So, yeah, that was pretty interesting. <laughs> they were not huge sharks, though. They were like six footers. I mean, they're three not. Sharks. And that's another thing about sharks is that it, they seem scary when you're watching them on TV. But when you're underwater and you have air and you're, you know, it's it's really not as scary to see a shark when you're scuba diving as you would think. It's you you get used to it pretty quick. Yeah, I I'm just thinking about being encircled by six foot <laughs> sharks and. Well, did you see that Roatan video where they were feeding the sharks and we were there? Oh, that was the best. It might even be a public video. Yeah, I'm that's not sure. thank you for talking about that because I wanted to ask you about your photography and your videography mm-hmm. underwater. Mm-hmm. I know you capture some amazing images yeah i mean i originally wanted to be a professional underwater photographer so i do have a pretty elaborate setup a full frame canon 5d mark IV with a you know big eight inch lens you know dome port and two you know big flashes and so i do have a pretty elaborate setup. that's a lot of numbers and letters and it sounds like fancy equipment yeah. so i'll i'll take your word for exactly. it that it's a big fat fancy camera yeah that's all that's, that's all you can really take away from that jen do you take photos and everything as well i'll grab the gopro like for example when we were in Roatan recently i was uh, using the strobing light and i was i follow after him um, most of the photography is done for him because he's got a super great eye for it. He's been doing it for so long. For me, it's about, you know, uh, grabbing the GoPro and following behind if I see something interesting 
or when he's busy taking photos, I will jump on with the, uh, the GoPro and take some video. But for the most part, I typically like to keep an eye on him because he's so preoccupied with taking photos that sometimes I'm the um, intermediate between the actual group and the dive master and John. So I'm sort of somewhere in the middle, but I usually have a, a pole spear with me and I'm usually looking for lionfish. So I kind of do both. I look for invasive lionfish and then I keep an eye on John and also I'll keep the GoPro and if there's inter interesting video, I'll take video. I do believe that we have some publicly available albums and videos on Facebook. I'll have to put that in the show notes so people can can check that out. And well, what's next on your list of diving trips? When are you going again? We're going back to Fiji in the fall. Indo-Pacific just has a different environment, different life, things that you'll see. Like you don't see sea, sea snakes here, but you'll see them all throughout Indonesia. So there's also muck diving, um, areas where it it's like, it's not visually the prettiest because you're not going to see a bunch of coral but you'll be able to see like amazing different types of sea life you'll never see here all concentrated within one particular area so mm -hmm. yeah indo-pacific is just you're going to see you'll you'll never see cuttlefish here because they don't exist here but you'll see them all throughout the indo-pacific and you know just be able to see this little animal and it fluoresces in other words it does this little light show it's pretty amazing so yeah, we're heading back to Fiji for sure. Oh my Fiji. goodness, that sounds that sounds wonderful. Wow. I am really, really, really happy that you took the time out of your Saturday to sit down and be on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. All right. The beach is speaking. Are you listening? You know, it's been a long time since I've been scuba diving. That's crazy, right? I live in Florida. Well, I asked John to share any resources that might be of interest, and I'll post them in the show notes. And stay tuned for part two coming up next when I relive some of my own close encounters of the marine kind. And I might even have a couple special guests for that one. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Beach Speaks. If you liked what you heard, share the podcast with another beach lover. And speaking of sharing, I want to know how the beach is speaking to you. Share your favorite beach story or why you love the beach so much. Maybe you have a beachy tip or two that you think other beach lovers might like to know. To record a message, just go to my website, thebeachspeaks.com. Click the voicemail button, it's super easy, and I'll play it on the show. And if more beach is what you crave, visit thebeachspeaks.com or follow The Beach Speaks on Facebook and Instagram, where I post all my gorgeous sunrise photos and videos. It's another way for you to reconnect with the beach, return to your soul, and reimagine your life. The Beach is speaking. Are you listening?